Hello friends and welcome to Escaping the Mouse with your host, me, Breck Roll. All right, we're going to do something a little bit different today. I talked about this a few days ago about some of the stuff that I might want to do when we get to the point where I have a job and can't necessarily go out and do something every day. And I talked about just discussing certain subjects that I kind of find fascinating. We're going to try one of those today. Uh, we're going to talk about the RidgeQuest earthquake that happened in California a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about how the earth was, is made and constructed and the different layers. We're going to talk about plate tectonics and the different kinds of earthquake faults. And then we're going to go talk about this earthquake and why it was such an unusual event. And um, I've got some really stunning images that uh, the USGS has released that really shows the magnitude of the damage uh, that occurred uh, on uh, July 5th. Actually, July 4th and July 5th. So let's get going with that. This is gonna be fun, I think. And if it isn't, we won't do it anymore. So the first thing we have to do is have a good image in our head about the different layers of the earth. And I've always found that just a common egg is a good model for that. Ignore for the fact that it isn't round, that it's egg shaped, but pretend that this is the earth and it's round. And for the layers that we're talking about, this is like a perfect model because it's got three different components, just like the earth does. Uh, we have the outer shell, which is the crust of our Earth, the part that we walk around on. It's between three and six miles thick in the ocean and between 20 and, mile, 20 and 30 miles thick on land. Underneath that is a layer of mantle. In this case, it's the white of the egg. Uh, that is roughly 1,800 miles thick, and it's basically, it's lava. And it's under high pressure and a high heat. And that's why when we have a little crack in the crust, it kind of squeezes out like toothpaste and becomes a volcano. Underneath that is an iron core, which is like the yolk of our uh, egg. The iron core is roughly 2,200 miles thick, and it's basically spinning, which is what creates our magnetic field and our north and south poles. Now, one of the problems we have with our Earth is that that outer shell, the crust, isn't one solid piece. It's actually seven major pieces and hundreds and hundreds of little pieces. And unfortunately, all those pieces are moving in opposite directions with each other and they're rubbing against each other. And when the pieces move, that's when we have an earthquake. So there are three different types of plate boundaries, which are the areas where the plates rub against each other. One of them is called a transform boundary and basically the plates are moving back and forth relative to each other. The second type is called a convergent plate boundary which is where there's two plates that are actually colliding with each other. Now those are interesting because one of two things happen. Um, if the plate boundary of a convergent plate is in the ocean, then generally the older, colder plate will subduct or go underneath the younger, warmer plate. If, on the other hand, the plate boundary is on Earth, they just mash together and it make, makes giant uh, mountain ranges. Uh, the Himalayans uh, are a good example of plate tectonics uh, and a convergent plate boundary because India is colliding with Asia and it's pushing up the, uh, the mountain range, uh, which includes uh, Mount Everest, which is the tallest uh, mountain on the earth. And then the third kind of plate boundary is called a divergent plate boundary, where the plates are actually moving apart from each other. The best example of that is the mid-oceanic ridge uh, between the Americas and Europe and Africa. If, you ever, if you've ever noticed that it looks like South America would fit together with uh, Africa and North America would fit together with Europe, it's because at one point they were and the, the land broke apart because of a divergent plate boundary that pushed the two continents apart and now they're thousands of miles apart. So now that we've gotten through the minutia a little bit about plate tectonics and how the earth is all constructed and all that, Let's start talking a little bit about the earthquake that occurred on July 4th and July 5th at RidgeQuest. First off, there's three faults that are kind of directly involved here. One of them you've heard of is called the San Andreas Fault. Obviously, that's uh, one of the major plate boundaries between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. But unfortunately, there's a bunch of other faults that are also involved here, including one that's called the Garlock Fault, uh, which has actually been kind of what makes San Andreas kind of a dangerous fault because normally San Andreas kind of runs, a, runs up the line of California in a straight line, but Garlock Fault intercepts it perpendicularly 
and has actually created a bend in the San Andreas Fault, which is relatively dangerous. And then, of course, uh, some of the pressure from the Garlock Fault has created something called the Owens Valley Fault Zone. And that was actually where this fault occurred. So let's look at that a little bit. So the action all started on July 4th at about 12.33 in the afternoon with a 6.4 earthquake in the Owens Valley Fault Zone. Ironically, there was uh, almost immediately there was a second 6.4 earthquake re registered in the same area about two minutes later. Now, for some reason, that was misregistered and it wasn't a 6.4. And about a day later, they revised it down to a 4.5. You know, sometimes we get an earthquake like this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion initially, and uh, especially on the on the internet today, the Earthquakes are recorded by computer and then later a significant event will be reviewed by a seismologist just to verify this. Now you ask a geologist, they will tell you that whenever you have a moderate earthquake or even a large earthquake like this, there's about a 5% chance that it's actually a precursor to a larger event. So seeing two 6.4 earthquakes within two minutes of each other wasn't completely unbelievable. But like I said, it, it ended up... Uh, dropping down pretty quick. The next day, of course, we had the 7.1 magnitude earthquake. That struck at 1019 at night. So that was a nice wake up call for people. And over the next six days, there were about 8,000 aftershocks on this uh, fault. As we get further and further away from the main quakes, uh, the number of aftershocks decrease uh, significantly. In the first couple days, there was probably an aftershock or two or three every minute. Now looking at it, there's probably one on average about every five minutes. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they aren't still happening and they will probably continue to happen for at least another few months, maybe a year or more. Uh, aftershocks can continue for years after the main event. So, you know, this is gonna be an interesting uh, period of time. And of course, in the days following this, you always get a whole bunch of footage now of, of the earthquake as it happens. Everything's plugged in. Everyone's got cameras today. So you always end up uh, seeing really great footage of this stuff all happening. Uh, Got to wonder about the poor cats on this thing running for their lives. And then this one, you can see a house kind of being uh, demolished a little bit, you know, from the earthquake inside. That was pretty scary, too. And then when, uh, when you get sloshing around in, the, in a swimming pool, that's called a seish. And uh, that was actually something that when I wrote an emergency plan over at Disney, one of the concerns that we had was what would happen to some of the lakes that are on property in the event of, a, of an earthquake. And we discussed that issue quite a bit. And of course, you can't have any news report on an earthquake without seeing surveillance footage of what happens to a liquor store. Now, I've been reading what some of the geologists have been saying about this, and they say that this was a really exciting earthquake just because of the area that it happened. It didn't really cause an enormous amount of property damage, and I don't think there were any deaths attributed to it. But because of where it happened, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, where there's not a lot of vegetation, where there's not a lot of buildings and stuff like that to cover up the... Uh, to cover up uh, the damage that happens in the ground displacement. There wasn't a lot of vegetation to cover stuff up, like when things like this happened in like in Indonesia or something like that. They, and because of the fact that we have such great satellite imagery right now, the USGS has been able to release some just extraordinary photos to show before and after what happened on the ground. And uh, some of this stuff is just stunning to look at. All right, so I think I'm done with that one today. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I actually kind of enjoyed doing it. it. Took a little time to put it all together because I shot and recorded it and edited this in a way different way than most of the stuff. Usually what I'll do is I'll shoot all my footage and then I'll cut it together later and maybe, maybe find some pictures to put over the top of it. Uh, this, I actually went looking for the pictures and the imagery and all that stuff first and then kind of came up with the text to kind of go along with it. 
So it was really edited more in a piecemeal mode. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you know, let me know in the comments and we'll see if we continue doing that. But until then, I think that's all I have. Thank you for watching Escaping the Mouse and I will see you next time. Good night.